Hello, this is David Diga Hernandez, and you're watching Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV Network. I'm finishing now my two-part series, Eight Myths About Speaking in Tongues. If you've been lied to and told that the spiritual gifts or speaking in tongues aren't for today, then I want to show you what the Bible teaches. And once we look to the Word of God for the final answer, that ends the debate. But first, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me. He's going to lead you in some very anointed worship. And then we're getting right into this message. Here is Stephen Moctezuma. So this is the final part of my two-part message, Eight Myths About Speaking in Tongues. I address four myths about speaking in tongues in part one, and now in conclusion, I'm going to address four more myths or lies that people believe about speaking in tongues. So myth number five, and this is continuing again from part one. The spiritual gifts are no longer in operation. Now, I don't believe that we should demonize those who misinterpret the Scripture. I think that many people are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. But they're still my brother. They're still my sister in Christ. Just because someone has misinterpreted the Bible and believes that the spiritual gifts are no longer in operation doesn't mean that they're not a Christian. It doesn't mean that they don't love Jesus. It doesn't mean that they don't want to follow Christ. It simply means that they misinterpreted the Scripture. And so I don't want to demonize anyone. This isn't my goal to cause division. And I don't think we should go around calling people we disagree with heretics or false prophets. These are areas we can disagree on without having to, how shall I say, step away from the foundations, which are the fundamentals of the faith. Now, I must make this clear. The Word of God 
is the final authority. It's the final word. So after the word of God has had its say, there's no debate. It's not really open for that. Either we believe the word of God or we don't. Either we take what the word of God says or we don't. And I understand that there are many who enjoy debating or who who enjoy showing off how intelligent they think they are or how much knowledge they think they have of the scripture. And it really is a spirit of pride that people come in when they enjoy doing those things. I understand, I understand discussion for discussion's sake, but I think we should do away with that spiritual pride. We should humble ourselves, come to the word of God, and treat it as the final authority that it is. So I'm going to give you a word here. The word is cessationist. And a cessationist is someone who believes that the spiritual gifts have ceased to uh, be in operation. Now, this, of course, is an oversimplification. There are different forms of cessationism, and some people apply it to different extremes. But I'm just giving you a very simplified way of looking at this. And again, we could talk about the definitions all day long. But right now, I just want to give you that simple thought, which is that a cessationist is basically someone who believes that the spiritual gifts are no longer in operation. And while I'm applying a label to those who believe these things, again, remember, it's not my goal to demonize these people. Now, it's very difficult, I have to admit, I have to admit this, it's difficult to address a cessationist biblically. That's not because we don't have the scripture on our side. That's because the arguments that cessationists put forward, the arguments that people who believe that the spiritual gifts have ceased put forward, aren't based in scripture at all. They literally just pull them out of nowhere and try to sometimes force meaning on scriptures where there is no meaning that they intended there. They do spiritual, scriptural gymnastics and really twist things to try to make it say something. So it's very difficult to address that kind of illogical approach. When someone just asserts something and holds that belief for no reason whatsoever, No matter what you show them in scripture, it's very difficult for them to change their minds. And that is hard to do. It's very difficult to get someone to change their minds because they have difficulty humbling themselves, admitting that they were wrong. And this is why it can be a challenge addressing the cessationists. But remember, they have no scriptural basis whatsoever. The evidence for spiritual gifts and the power of God still being in operation today is overwhelmingly on our side. Those who push these beliefs, really have a lot of work ahead of them, and they use, generally speaking, three different lines of logic that I've observed. Now, of course, there are several arguments, there are several points they make, but all of them, categorically speaking, fall under one of these three lines of logic. Number one, speculation. So an example of this, they'll say something like, only the early epistles mention the spiritual gifts, but the later ones make no mention of them, so the gifts must have ceased. Or example two, They'll say something like, Paul the Apostle had poor eyesight. Because God didn't heal him, that demonstrates that the gift of healing and the other gifts along with it have ceased. Now, here's the issue with that sort of reasoning. In order to demonstrate biblically that the spiritual gifts have ceased, you have to be able to point to the Bible verse that tells us so. Otherwise, you're just left with speculation. The biblical evidence is overwhelmingly supportive of the spiritual gifts. It's not even close. So again, you notice here, I'm not using a scripture at this point because the cessationists really just kind of asserts that worldview and they don't really provide much for it except for that speculation. So I'm simply showing you how they form their beliefs. And one of those is speculation. For example, as I just said, they'll say something like, well, you know, this apostle had poor eyesight and if the spiritual gifts were still in operation, he would have been healed. Now, this is to say, at least if you follow the line of logic all the way down to its conclusion, that anytime anyone experienced any ailment, that that must demonstrate to us that God was therefore no longer working in the miraculous in that period of time. But this, of course, we know is nonsensical. There were seasons to God's working, even from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament. The second line of logic that they follow are arguments from history. Example number one, some of the early church fathers believed that the gifts had ceased and therefore we should believe the same. And while we honor the church fathers, it's important that we do not idolize the church fathers. The question has never been, what did the early church fathers believe? The question has always been, what does the scripture teach? And even if you could prove, even if you could prove that some of the early church fathers believed that the spiritual gifts had ceased or were about to cease, 
all that proves is that there were cessationists who existed back then too. And all you're proving is that there was a debate about it then as well. Example number two, along the lines of arguments from history, they'll say something like, church history records a decline in the use of spiritual gifts. Now, in order to say something like this, because it's a huge assumption, you would have to have a complete record of the actions that every believer took every day. There are thousands of actions that you and I choose every single week that will never be put in historical record. What you have to actually find is these people saying or teaching very clearly that in fact the spiritual gifts have ceased. And even if you do find that, which is difficult in most cases, you're still left with the point I made just earlier, which is that all you're demonstrating is that there were cessationists who exist back then. And again, the problem is not, or the question I should say is not, what did the early church fathers believe? We honor them. We don't idolize them. They were men too. The question is, what does the scripture actually teach? And we must honor the scripture. The cessationist is being presumptuous when he claims that generations of believers didn't pray in tongues. How on earth could the cessationist know what didn't happen in the early church? To know that, one would have to have a complete record of every life of every believer. A record detailing even daily activity, we don't have that. In fact, to make the claim that a certain Christian figure or group of people certainly didn't pray in tongues, we would need a record of them telling us just that. So anyone who tells you that the early church didn't pray in tongues is making a big assumption. In fact, it's presumptive to make that claim about any believer in history's timeline. Number three, their third line of logic that they follow. And again, I'm still addressing the fifth myth, which is the first, first one for this portion of the sermon series, I'm still addressing the spiritual gifts are no longer in operation. That's a lie. And I'm showing you the lines of logic that people who believe this follow. Number one, speculation. Number two, arguments from history. And number three now, that third line of logic, poor biblical interpretation. As I said, the burden of proof rests on the cessationists. They have to show us in the scripture, and this is the challenge here, where in fact does the Bible teach very clearly that right here on history's timeline is where God suddenly stopped interacting with man in a miraculous way. And here, of course, they would often or most likely assert, well, you know, we don't say that God stopped working. We still believe in healing. We just believe that the gift of healing has ceased to be in operation. And this is kind of an interesting way out, but it's still semantics. And the reason they have to retreat to this type of poor argument is because they don't have the foundation to stand on. So when somebody says something like, well, we still believe God moves, we still believe God heals, we still believe God does the miraculous, but we believe that the spiritual gifts have ceased, you have to ask yourself what they actually believe the spiritual gifts were in the first place. They'll say, well, we, we believe that God still moves, but man no longer wields that power anymore. But who among us actually believes that man ever wielded that power? I certainly don't. Most charismatics certainly don't. We don't believe that man had the control over the gift. Even in the times when it seemed as though men were persuading God to do something, it was always according to his will. So this idea that God still moves but that it's no longer the spiritual gifts in operation is a dodge. Just as God moved, it's really quite simple, just as God moved according to his will through people in the Old Testament and New Testament, so God moves according to his will through people now. The spiritual gifts are no exception to God's sovereignty. Moses, Elijah, Peter, Paul, all of them, even though they may have carried certain spiritual powers, were still subject to the will of God and the sovereignty of God. And the spiritual gifts are no exception to this. So to say that God still moves, but just not in the way that it's described specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is in fact a dodge. All we are saying is that God interacts with us and through us, and it's according to his will and his power, and it always has been, and it always will be. Nothing has changed. So truthfully, and this is me being honest, or this is me being kind here, and I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not trying to attack any individual. I don't attack people, I attack principles and ideas. And these ideas, which are based in religious, faithless thinking, have to be torn down because they are their heresy, their, their, their misinterpretation of scripture, and they must be torn down in favor of what the Bible actually teaches. So truthfully, the best a cessationist can offer is a misapplication or misinterpretation of this portion of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
verses 8 through 10, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now, our knowledge is partial and incomplete, but even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. So this is talking about a time when the spiritual gifts will cease to be useful at all. And it tells us, the scripture does, exactly when this will be. In fact, just keep reading. Don't stop there. That's what you call a proof text, when they just take what they want and apply it. Let's take a look at what the scripture says in context. That's always important. Let's go down to verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. So, when will the spiritual gifts cease? When I know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. I don't think there's anyone who knows everything completely. Some cessationists might think so, but in fact, the Bible makes it very clear that this is not something that happens until much later. We're talking about eternity. Think about this. Why would we need prophecy when we are personally living in eternity? There's no future. Why would we need healing in a place where there is no sickness? These are the types of questions you have to ask yourself. Of course, the spiritual gifts will cease, but that's not until the other side of eternity. And as we just read, the scripture makes that 100% clear. Until then, the spiritual gifts are for today. It's not debatable if we allow the word of God to have the final say. Now I want to move on to myth number six. Because Jesus didn't pray in tongues, neither should we. Now, it's an assumption, and I think it's a safe assumption, to say that Jesus did not pray in tongues as we understand it today. And again, that is a safe assumption. But the myth that I'm addressing here is not Jesus didn't pray in tongues, because that could be true. In fact, it's likely that it is true that Jesus didn't pray in tongues, and that's what I personally believe. But the myth I'm addressing here is that because Jesus didn't pray in tongues, neither should we. That's for some reason because Jesus didn't exercise this spiritual gift that neither should we. I don't deny that Jesus probably didn't pray in tongues. I, I deny the lie that because Jesus didn't pray in tongues, we shouldn't. So why didn't Jesus pray in tongues? And again, this is a safe assumption we're making. Why didn't Jesus pray in tongues? The same reason Jesus never shared a testimony of being saved from sin. He was perfect. Praying in tongues supplements my inability to pray. Jesus lacked no ability to pray. Praying in tongues helped me when I don't know what to pray. Jesus always knew what he should pray. Praying in tongues helps me to pray according to God's will. Jesus was God's will in action. Jesus didn't need to pray in tongues because he was already praying perfectly fine. When you and I start praying perfect prayers, then we won't need the gift of tongues. But until then, that's a spiritual gift we must exercise. Myth number seven, you could become demonized if you attempt to pray in tongues. Well, let's look at what the Bible says. Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. And this is not about the gift of speaking in tongues. Let me make that clear. But the principle that we can glean from this portion of Scripture is that if we ask God for the Holy Spirit, He's not going to send something else. And that principle can, of course, apply to the discussion on speaking in tongues. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? I trust not in my ability to receive. I trust in His ability to give. I trust that when I ask the Lord... Now, I ask my father in the name of Jesus for a spiritual gift, and he's not going to send a demonic spirit. Consider it more deeply now. Think about the fact that they say you could become demonized, or it's demonic, or it's witchcraft. And I, I think about the, the, it's almost like this conspiracy theory-like mindset, this paranoia. I'm thinking, demonized, really? I mean, at best, it's a gift from God where we can pray in a heavenly language and be edified. At worst, it's another expression. It's another human expression that we give towards God. Would you say that someone could be demonized for humming? 
That could be some melody that you hum. There's no understanding to it. There's no communication in it. It's just an expression of emotion that we let out. Would you tell someone that crying could make them demonize? That too is an emotional expression. And again, I'm not saying that tongues is only an emotional expression. I'm comparing it to those other emotional expressions in the case that the cessationist would be right, that that's all it ever is. How would that cause someone to become demonized? That I, that I lift a sound to God in worship, that again would be the same as just humming a song. So again, at best, it's a heavenly gift. At worst, it's another expression of worship. It's harmless if it's not truly a gift. Now, of course, we believe, I believe, and the Bible clearly teaches, that it's a spiritual gift. I'm simply t trying to demonstrate the fact that even if it wasn't a spiritual gift, which it is, that there's no way it could possibly cause, some, be, cause someone to become demonized. That's just paranoia. Finally, myth number eight, you cannot control the gift of tongues. Now, this has been a, a, a common talking point where people talk about how God will just give you the gift and it's just going to happen. People who struggle to receive the gift of speaking in tongues believe this. Skeptics believe this, but this is a big lie. Ask yourself this, and I'll simply reference 1 Corinthians 14, the entire chapter. Why would Paul the Apostle devote almost an entire chapter teaching us how to control the spiritual gift if, in fact, the spiritual gift could not be controlled? The Bible teaches that the spiritual gift is, in fact, under our control. All spiritual gifts require some exercise of faith on the part of the one using them. Why would speaking in tongues be any different? So am I saying that speaking in tongues is something that can be taught? No, not necessarily. I can't teach you to see, but I can teach you to observe. I can't teach you to hear, but I could teach you to listen. The spiritual gift is deposited, given by the Holy Spirit, but there are things that we can do to exercise that which He has given us. He's given us the ability to live holy lives, we have to choose to exercise that holiness. He's given us the ability to evangelize, but we have to choose to open our mouths and evangelize. He's given us the ability to pray, but we have to choose to devote the time to prayer. He's given us the ability to pray in tongues, but we must choose to activate our partnership with Him by taking actions of faith to cause that gift to come forward. These are the eight myths about speaking in tongues and I pray today that the Word of God would go forth like a hammer and break all of the misconceptions. Now I understand there's a lot of different angles that we can cover. I mean, I can't cover everything in a lesson this short, even though it's two-part. And I'm sure in the comment section, there's gonna be someone presenting an angle that they think we haven't thought of, but I promise you this, you study the Word, you study the Scripture, and I know that God will stir your faith to receive this gift of speaking in tongues. Don't ever let anyone bully you or lie to you or deceive you or intimidate you into thinking that the gift of tongues is not for today and that the gift of tongues is not for you. Let the truth of the Word of God have the final say. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you've broken the power of every religious spirit and I thank you that even now you're stirring those who've been asking for this, even those, Lord, who've been on the fence wondering about what the Word says concerning this. I pray now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would so fill them with boldness and with power. Use them for your glory, I pray, and let that gift come to life in them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And I want you to say it because you believe it. Say, Amen. Well, that is it for the lesson. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you. We're praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you like information on how you can join the Spirit family, then go to davidhernandezministries.com slash spiritchurch. Join the day. It's absolutely free. When you go to that link or the URL, just scroll down toward the bottom of the page. You're going to see a form. It'll take you about a minute or two to fill out, and that's your membership. Then you're a part of Spirit Church and you'll get a message every single week that will help you to grow spiritually according to the Word of God. And of course, you'll also get a beautiful worship cover from our very own Mr. Stephen Moctezuma. Now to your comments. These comments come from 
part one of this message. And I'm going to read just a few of them. I went a little long in the lesson, so I'm going to read just a few of them. But I want you, if you want me to potentially read your comment on next week's edition of Spirit Church, to leave a comment in the comment section right now. And while you're at it, be sure you're connected with us on all of our social media platforms, including YouTube. Make sure you're subscribed to YouTube. Click that notification bell and make sure you set it to receive all notifications so that you don't miss any content from Encounter TV. And now here are the comments from last week's teaching, Eight Myths About Speaking in Tongues, Part 1. Robert Baurosen writes, What a timely, important, and anointed message and very anointed music by Steve. Jason Ikuru writes, I want to speak in tongues, but it has not manifested yet. And then Jason went back to edit it. I started praying in tongues as I was worshiping. I give God the glory for this wonderful gift. This is, this is awesome what we're seeing happen for Jason. And this is actually a testament to what we've been seeing. There are believers who've come out of movements that taught that the gift of speaking in tongues isn't for today. I'm not saying that's Jason. I don't know Jason's backstory. All I know is that Jason wanted the gift and got the gift. Praise God. And the final comment I'll read comes from Uche Kingsley, who writes, Thank you, Pastor, for bringing understanding to this subject. I have been doubting myself ever since I started speaking in tongues, but the knowledge and understanding of this teaching changed my perspective about speaking in tongues. Steve, I love what you are doing and pray that I will be able to worship like you. God bless you. I'm always so excited to see how lives are being transformed by this content. But you know there's a lot more to this ministry than just the videos that come out. Not only do we release content almost daily now, we have a podcast, we have a blog, we have live streams, we do events, in-person events, miracle services all around the United States and the world. And we have the Holy Spirit School, which is a free Bible training program. This ministry is busy. It's the Holy Spirit's ministry. He's accomplishing His work through it. The power of God is being demonstrated all over the world. People are being saved. People are being delivered. People are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Lives are being transformed. And I want you to be a part of it. I want you to consider today becoming a monthly financial supporter of this ministry. Now, as a supporter, you're going to support all of those things I told you about. In addition to that, you'll also know that your gift is helping to advance the gospel. And you do it, because, of course, we know you do it because you love the Lord. But we want you to know that when you become our partner, we also like to give back to you just to show our appreciation. So if you partner with us for $10 or more a month, take a look at this, you're going to have access to our monthly Zoom calls. That's a Zoom call with Steve and I. We will interact with you. We get to speak with each other, get to know one another. These partner calls are the best. They're awesome. And you get to find out ministry information and announcements before everyone else does. You'll also get a 10% discount on all ministry apparel. You'll get a beautiful Dove lapel pin that you can wear to our events or really anywhere to show your support for the gospel. You're going to get a monthly email with an exclusive update just for you. Think about that. How else can you better spend $10? There's no way to know that that $10 is funding the media, the live streams, the events, the Holy Spirit School, and all of the other projects that we do, and knowing that you're giving to the gospel, and knowing that you have all of those wonderful benefits coming your way. There's no better way to spend $10 a month. Also, for those of you who will give $30 or more a month, you're going to get all of those benefits. Plus, you're going to get to select one of these books, Carriers of the Glory, Encountering the Holy Spirit in Every Book of the Bible, 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare, and Praying in the Holy Spirit. You can choose one of those as your partnership initiation gift. But if you partner with us for $100 or more, you're going to get all of those benefits, except, check this out, your apparel discount is going to double from 10% to 20%, and you're not going to get to select one book. We're going to send you all four. Now, of course, I emphasize again, we know you do this because you love Jesus. We know we do this for the Lord. We know we do this for souls, but this is our way of giving back. So become a partner today. Be a part of what we're doing. Help us continue to grow and expand everything that's happening at this ministry. You can also give a one-time gift. Go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner to partner with us. Remember to always check that website for the latest partnership program offer as they do change from time to time. Or you can give 
a one-time gift. Maybe you're saying, I'm not quite ready to do a partnership yet, but I can give a one-time gift. Go right now, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Give a one-time gift of 25. Give a one-time gift of 50. Do as the Spirit leads you. So again, monthly partnership, davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. Join our army of supporters. And that is it for this edition of Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV network. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. This message was taken from my latest book, Praying in the Holy Spirit. Order now at Amazon.com. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. Also, help us spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.